Welcome to the fourth lecture in Module 6, and in this lecture we'll talk about HTML forms. Now so far we've learned how to build static websites and use HTML elements to create very static websites. In order to build interactivity, we'll have to learn about forms, and forms are the ways that, it, forms are the way that you provide interactivity in a website. This is what allows you to collect information from users, and it's actually done using the HTML form element. So there's a form element in HTML that we'll use to create forms. Now user information is collected in an HTML form via the web browser, and then it's submitted to the web server for processing. That's how this works. And we've already seen how controllers take that information and process it through this params hash that we talked about in the last module. Now, if HTML form um, is a section of a document that contain, it can contain normal HTML markup as well as something called controls. And we'll cover some of the various controls that exist later in this lecture. But uh, you've probably seen some of, them, some of these controls as you've interacted with web pages. For example, check boxes, radio buttons, drop down lists, uh, uploading files, things like that. Users complete a form by modifying these controls. And then they do, to modify the control, you enter text or select a um, particular selection, select a checkbox, things like that. So when a form is submitted, the data is first processed by the user agent that's running inside of your browser. And then it's submitted to the processing agent that's on the server side. So it's sent to the server side after it first processes the form. This is the basic structure of the form element. So you see the form tag there, and there's two attributes. There's an action attribute and a method attribute. And then I show as a comment where the form control goes. And then the next line, this input type equal, equal submit, that is what creates the button. And the button will have the value login. So this will create a button on the web page that says login. And then you see the close tag for the form. Now, the action attribute, this is what's used to specify the URL that the form data will be sent to once that login button is selected by the user. And the method attribute is simply the HTTP uh, request method that it'll use. In this case, I'm specifying the get method for, um, for this particular form. This is the one I've used. I show that the two choices are get, in which case the form is sent as part of a URL encoded and attached to the URL and sent to the server. And if you do a post, then the form data actually goes in the message request body. So I'll look, we'll look at both of these now. So here's how URL encoding works for a get request. The form data is separated from the original URL by a question mark, and then there are name value pairs that are separated by an ampersand, and in between the name and values, an equal sign. If there are unsafe characters, uh, they need to be escaped, and I'll show you what that means in just a moment. Here's another example of a form. So again, we see the form tag, and we see where this form is going to be submitted to, which is www.example.com. We're going to use the get method in this case as well. Now next, there's another HTML element called label. This, um, what's going to happen here is this first name is going to show up as a label in the web page, and then there's your first control that we're presenting. It's um, the HTML element input, and it's of type text, and this will create a little text box for you, for you to enter a first name. And then there's a break, and then there's another label, and um, a control for entering a last name. Finally, at the bottom of the screen, there's a submit button, and the value of it is submit, submit form. So there'll be a button on this web page called submit form. Let's take a look at what it looks like in the browser. And um, here's an example of uh, the URL um, that I've, I've submitted here. Uh, it was actually a file on my machine, and you'll see that it was module space 6. Well, that was escaped. That's what that percent 20 is. That's an escaped uh, space. And so this is an example of how um, characters are escaped uh, in, um, in HTML. Now, uh, I've entered a first name and a last name here, and when I hit that submit button at the bottom, this is what it produces. So let's take a look. Here is the www.example.com, and the URL encoding is everything past that. So there's the question mark, first name equal Carol, 
the ampersand, ampersand to separate the name value pairs, last name equal code good. So again, the www.example.com, that was specified in the action attribute. The get method should be used when a form is idempotent. In other words, if the form is not going to create side effects on the server, you should use the get method. If the form is used to search a database, for example, it's not producing side effects, so it's appropriate in this case to use the get method. You should not send sensitive data um, using the get method because it's available, as we saw, it's available right in the address field uh, in the browser. Anyone can see it if they're monitoring network traffic. Uh, the get method should also not be used if there's a large amount of form data you're sending or if the form data contains non-ASCII characters. That can cause, um, or binary data. These are hard to represent using URL encoding. And finally, the, the get method cannot be used if the form contains a file upload control. A file upload um, uh, cannot be passed in the URL. You actually have to pass it in a POST request. And so let's talk about POST requests next. As, again, this is the other way that you can submit a form. So if there is server-side processing associated with a form, in other words, it causes side effects on the server side, then you should use the POST method. If the form data is sensitive, you should switch to the HTTPS protocol, and then the form data will be encrypted as it's sent to the server. Let's look at this same example. This is the exact same example as the previous one. The only thing that's changed here is if you look at method equal uh, post rather than method equal get. Let's look at what that looks like in the browser. It looks identical. There's nothing different. I've entered a first name and a last name. And when I click submit form, this is what it looks like. The URL now, in this case, is, was unchanged. There's no URL encoding. But if you look at the, um, if I use the, um, if I explore the network traffic, and I'm just using Chrome's uh, developer tools here, if you look at the network traffic, you see here that the form data sent has first name, equal Helen with an and, and last name equal Hackmeister. So that was sent as a part of the post in the, um, as, as, a, as, as a part of the post method in the message body. Now, let's talk about the process, the form submission process. Here's what's actually happening. The user agent that's running in your browser identifies the successful controls. Um, so if somebody didn't enter a name um, or if, if a, uh, actually, I think even if a name is not entered, it'll send it as a blank name. But uh, when we deal with checkboxes and so forth, if, if something's not checked, then that one won't be sent. So that's, uh, the user agent identifies those controls that are considered successful. It builds a data set of the control name, current value pairs, and it sends them either as a part of the URL, as I showed you, or as a part of the message body in the case of a post. The form data is encoded according to the content type, and the content types that might be available are application, the one I'm showing you here for URL encoded. This is the default. And if you look, both the get method that we used and the post method did this type of encoding. One was in the URL, as I showed you. The other was in the message body for the post. These are the other ones you might see, multi-part form data um, and text play. Uh, in, th in this case, the form data is just sent um, in, the, in this last case, the form data is just sent as plain text. It's not encoded in the way I showed you. Now, the user agent submits the encoded data set to the processing agent running on the server side using the HTTP protocol and um, to the specific URL that's provided with that action attribute. So that's the form submission process. Lastly, let's talk about the form controls that are available to you. And I'm just going to talk about a couple of these things. So if we've already said that the user interacts with a web page through these form controls. And we've seen the input element, and the other one that we're going to, the other HTML element we'll use is the select element. They appear in between the form, open form tag and the closed form tag. All of the controls go in there. That's what creates your form. The name of a control is specified using the name attribute. The name attributes um, can be important for the control. And you saw this in the previous example I gave you. I'll show you a few more examples in just a moment. But here's what happens with every control. Every control has an initial value and a current value. And both of these are character strings. So when you first 
open up the form, it has an initial value. If a user enters data, then that becomes the current value. Um, available form controls include text, date, buttons, check boxes, radio boxes, select boxes. These are drop-down lists, for example. You can do file select boxes. There's actually hidden controls that allow you to pass information. Uh, by the way, these hidden controls aren't for passing secret information, so don't use it for that. They're really for passing meta information, for example. Um, it could be additional information. about If you've got a very long form, it may uh, um, pass information about the part of the form a user's working on, something like that. To see a list of all of the forms, uh, form controls that are available to you, go to the www. Uh, w.w3schools.com and look at the full list. There's a lot there. I'm just going to go over a few right now. So button controls, this is a very common one to create a button on a page. Um, there's a button element and an input element and both of them can be used to create a button. And the type attribute um, always has to be specified if you're trying to create a button. So you can have a submit button. We've already seen these. Those were the examples that I uh, showed you previously. This causes the form to be submitted to the URL specified in that action attribute. You can have a reset, and um, the type can be reset. And this causes the form to be reset. So you can create a button that when you click it, it resets the form control to their initial values. And then you can just use button to create a push button. Um, and typically, you associate some uh, client-side script with this button. So when it's pressed, some JavaScript is executed. We'll look more at that in a later lecture. Now, with the input element, the type attribute can be specified as image. And you've probably seen this on certain web pages where the button itself is an image, or you put an image inside of a button. So this allows you to create a graphical submit button. And the source attribute as a part of this HTML element can be a URL that points to a particular image file, and this can be used to decorate the button if you want to get a little fancy. Now, button attributes have numerous um, uh, buttons have numerous attributes associated with them that create this event-driven programming paradigm. That's what you're doing in a web page, right? Um, in a web application, you're clicking buttons, and then the application is responding to that. That's event-driven programming. So the, this programming style supports interactivity in the browser, right? You click a button, an event happens, the event is processed, right? Typically, this is by executing some JavaScript, and then the browser is changed. What's in the browser window changes. You can define some event attributes as a part of this button element. So, um, for example, if you, uh, a few of these are on blur, on focus, on click. So. For example, onClick says that when you click this particular control, call the JavaScript that I've associated with the onClick attribute. When you mouse over a button, you can have it change color. That's the on mouse over attribute. So all of these are available to you if you want to have your button be a little bit more active. Uh, sometimes this is a useful thing to do because when a user moves their mouse over a button, if they see it change color, they know they can interact with that button. Now, for each of these, again, the attribute, uh, the, the value that's supplied with the attribute is typically a script that says what you should do when that event occurs. Let's talk about a few additional um, commonly used controls. So checkboxes, radio buttons, they're, they're kind of similar. You use the input element, the HTML input element, and these are on off toggled switches that are almost the same. I'll tell you the difference between these. Um, first of all, though, these controls share the same control name. So you might have, um, have somebody check a box for the year they are in, in college, for example. And so they would all fall within one name about, uh, that might be, for example, year in college. Um, a sw one of these either radio button or check boxes is considered on when its checked attribute is set. So there's an attribute called check. And when the form is submitted, only the on checkbox and radio button controls are treated as successful. So I talked previously about how the user agent looks for successful controls. In the case of check boxes and radio buttons, you're looking for those ones that have been switched on. If several 
radio button controls share the same name, they're mutually, mutually exclusive. If you click one and then click another, the one that you originally clicked will be turned off. In other words, you can only have one clicked within that group. This is different for checkboxes. You can have multiple checkboxes selected at the same time. In other words, you can have multiple checkboxes within a single named control that can be checked, that can be turned on. Let's talk about text and file select, all right? So um, there are two types of text controls. Both of them use the input element. Most of these are using the input element. We've already seen the text. This is what I used for the first name and last name in that form. It creates a single line. If you want to create a bigger area, you use text area. So that's pretty straightforward. And you can try that. Take the code that I gave you previously, substitute text area for text, and you'll see it creates a bigger box. The file select control allows you to specify a file that a user can attach to the control and when it's submitted the file will be sent to the server, to the processing agent. Um, there's also a password input control and this also uses the input element, right? And then you say type equal password and when the user enters a password, it shows up as a sequence of dots. So they don't show up on the screen. The text itself doesn't show up on the screen. This is a nice, uh, a nice thing to do so that if somebody's looking over the user's shoulder, they can't see the password. Lastly, I'd like to talk about select boxes. Um, you've probably seen these on web pages where you uh, click a little arrow and then you get a selection that you can choose from. These are drop-down select boxes. Now, each choice offered by the menu is represented using this option element and each select element must contain at least one of those. You can also group a bunch of options together, and you may have seen this if you've got groups of options within a drop-down box. You, you, do, you do that with this opt group element. Um, the opt group must appear directly within the select element, um, they can't, and they can't be nested. So here's a simple example. Select is the name of the element, and I've named the, this particular one uh, SEL color. And you see option, selected equal. This is going to show up in the browser. The one that says select color is originally going to show up in the browser, initially going to show up in the browser. And notice that it's between the option open tag and the option close tag there. And then I've got red, blue, and green. So uh, experiment with this. Create a simple web page. Put this in the body of your HTML section. And you'll see it'll create a very simple drop down box where a user can select either red, green, or blue. Now there's no submit button here, so add that, submit it, and then take a look at what the browser sends to the server. Let's now take a look at how forms are handled in Rails. Let's take a look at how Rails generates forms. Now when you ran your scaffold generator for the posts and comments, it created a code that allowed you to perform the CRUD operations. Now, the C in that is create. In order to create a new post or comment, you're going to need to do that through a form. And let's take a look at how Rails does that precisely. Go to App, Views, Posts, and then let's select the new.html.erb. And you'll see here that there's a line called render. You'll notice this is um, ERB, right? Uh, and you'll see here it says render form. Now that says to render uh, this, this is actually called a partial template called form. And what Rails does is it looks in the current directory for what's known as a partial template. And the partial template will have the name underscore form. And you'll see that's it right here. Underscore form.html.erb. Let's take a look at it. This is the actual form. So it's rendering this, um, this, this code in order to generate HTML. Let's look at the various pieces of this. Here's the uh, command. Um, again, this is, this is embedded Ruby. So here is the form for a post. All right. And here's the end of, of this particular um, command for the form for command. And the first part of this is all uh, errors. If there's errors, how they get uh, displayed on your screen. Here's the important part for actually creating the form. And there's three parts to it. There's three divs here. There's a div uh, that has class field. And there's embedded Ruby that says let's create a label for title and then a text field for that title as well. And notice that there's a break here in between. And here's the second div, again, of class field. And let's create a label 
for the body and a text area. So this is a text area while this one was a text field. And then finally, one more div to create a submit button. And this, gets, this is what gets rendered to create a form in Rails. Now, why did we use a partial template for this? That's because both edit and new have a form in them. And so why repeat this code? This is an example of don't repeat yourself. New, uh, let's take another look at it. It calls render form. Well, so does edit. Edit does the same thing. It renders the same form, um, but it stores the, the existing post that you're looking at. It'll populate that form with its uh, elements that you can edit it. So that's why the, a partial template was used is partial template uh, underscore form because it's actually called twice, once from new and once from edit. Let's take a look at what this looks like in the browser. Now I've started the web server running for the blog application. So if I go to localhost 3000 posts new, I should see that uh, form rendered. And here it is, sure enough. There's the three divs that we saw, the title, the body, and then this button for creating the post. Uh, let's take a look in the developer tools at the HTML that was actually created here, that was actually generated. And if we go under this form, you'll see that there's actually one more div that's added automatically by Rails. It's this div that actually has some um, interesting things that uh, are intended for uh, security. So I'm not going to uh, go into that, but this particular div is actually, um, there's, a, there's an authenticity token here to make sure that somebody's not hacking um, hacking your website. So here's the first div that was created and notice it creates a label for post title and th there it is that's it, uh, the actual uh, HTML that's printed is title and here's one for and there's the input element and here's the next div for the post body there's the input element again this one's a text area while this one above is um, a text field um, and then Lastly, let's take a look at the button that's created. So here is an input button of type submit, and the value is create post, and that's why this uh, button says create post. And so this is how this form is rendered in HTML using that Ruby code. And if we go to edit, we have to pick a particular post and go to edit. You'll see that it actually populates this, it's using the same form again, and it's just populating it with this particular post. And again, this code is being reused to generate this form. This completes the fourth lecture in Module 6.